Welcome to Hebrew Readers Church, everybody. We hope everybody's been enjoying the Shabbat day. I'm your brother, Zachwa. This is your brother, Kasafo, and we're Hebrew Readers Church. Uh, we hope that everybody's been having a blessed week this week. That Allah has been merciful and gracious to everybody. Uh, delivered you out of situations, whatever the case is. We pray and we thank, we're thankful unto him for all the things that he's done for us. And we're completely endowed in, into him. Um, Brother Kazafo, you got anything before we get started on this wonderful lesson this Shabbat today? Just want to say amen to what you just said there, brother. <laughs> uh, uh, we all see what mood Kazafo is in today. <laughs> but, but truly, we, we do hope everybody had a wonderful week. We hope everybody's Shabbat today is going bless it and um we do praise Allah for it uh, Kathy you got anything for real this time <laughs> no I don't <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right well we have a great lesson today how to be harmless as a dove how to be harmless as doves excuse me all right brother Kathy all right as believers dwelling in the world we are still not to be of the world can you read First John chapter two verse fifteen to seventeen, please? First John chapter two verse fifteen. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of Allah abideth forever. Being of the Father and striving for righteousness to do his will, we have to walk in his wisdom in this world. Can you read Colossians chapter 4, verse 5, please? Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. The Father is on high, so our character has to exemplify his wisdom from above, though we dwell in the world. Can you read James chapter 3, verse 17, please? But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. That's a great scripture for assessing our everyday interactions and character toward others. Along with this wise behavior, our speech has to align with his grace, knowing that we have been given grace from our former and own shortcomings. Can you read Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, please? Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how ye ought to answer every man. We have to speak gracefully, lest we offend unrighteously, and we have to love all people, regardless of their beliefs or lifestyle. Can you read Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 to 45, please? Okay. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Our Lord is teaching us how to do better, to keep the law in a better way because we've been commanded to be perfect of all time. Can you read Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 13, please? Thou shalt be perfect with Ahaya the Elohim. Along with good character and the fruits of wisdom and sound speech, it's also our wisdom in this world to keep the statutes and judgments of our Father. Can you read Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, please? Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as Ahia my Elohim commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whether ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. The world doesn't view this as wisdom, yet nonetheless, we are called to be harmless as doves in the midst of wolves while being wise as serpents. Can you read Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, please? Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. 
We discussed the rudiments of the world before. Now, we hope to cover how we are to operate in wisdom harmlessly as doves in our trials in this world. Now, when it comes to spending time with unbelievers casually, Christ, our example, is not resistant to eating or spending time with people that may not have been full in the faith or aware of the faith. Can you read Matthew chapter 9, verse 10 to 13, please? And it came to pass, as Yahshua said at meat in the house, Behold, many publican, publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. So from his example, hanging out with or eating in general with folks who may not believe as we believe or be in unrighteousness is not a sin in itself because people need to see an example of righteousness in this world. And we are called unto peace with all. Yet the self-righteous don't see it as such. Can you read Matthew 9 verse 11, please? And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eat of your master with publicans and sinners? But when Yahshua heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So as merciful people as our Lord, we don't completely separate ourselves from folks so as not to spend time with them just because they don't believe what we believe. We would need to come out of the world if that were the case. Can you read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 and 10, please? I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for them must ye needs to go out of the world. You might have loved ones that fall into these categories, yet that doesn't mean we can't associate with them seeing our Lord was even gentle to them too. And just be mindfully aware, lest you fall into the snares of sin that they are engulfed in. We, as our Lord, are to be a light unto the world, and he shed his light by spending time with believers and sinners alike, so as to shed the light of life unto all. Can you read Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 to 16, please? Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle. I'm not sure I understand. Sorry. Neither do men light a candle. Yeah, that was Siri, man. Siri just wants to hop in there. <laughs> I was like, oh, I thought the comment section came on the video. I was like, oh, oh man. <laughs> Go ahead. Good old Apple. Uh, Matthew 5 and 15. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Notice your light is shine through your good works. That's what glorifies our Father in heaven. Now, in regards to Yache, if folks asked him to come by and spend time casually, he wouldn't deny them, even if they weren't his disciples. Can you read Luke chapter 7, verse 36, please? And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. So we see by his example that if we're invited to kick it for some casual time, it's righteous to hang out with the person regardless of their beliefs. The unrighteous viewed Christ as bad for being friendly towards the just and unjust alike. Can you read Matthew chapter 11, verse 19, please? The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Amen. He was a friend of publicans and sinners, treating all people well. See that wisdom led him to be harmless and peaceable with all? He was being perfect, being merciful unto all men. Can you read Luke chapter 6, verse 36, please? Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. All right. Can you read verse 31 to 33, please, of that same chapter? And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For as ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. 
Can you also read Matthew chapter 5, verse 47 and 48, please? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even a public consult? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. In perfection, we treat people good, regardless of who they are or what they believe. We only especially do it to them that believe. Can you read Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, please? And let, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Now as believers among brothers and sisters in the faith of Yachin, we have certain commands as opposed to spending casual time with unbelievers in the world. Can we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, please? But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one, no, not eat. He's talking about people in a faith that's given over to these spirits, operating as reprobate. Not one that is fighting these spirits to overcome them. Eating together on feast days and associating with that person only leads to confusion, seen as the person's given over to these spirits and having no shame. We do this so that the person may see their shame and repent, as Paul was instructing the people to do in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. Can you read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, please? Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So we don't spend the feast days eating with brothers and sisters who are still walking in iniquity unrepentantly. He said of the person be a fornicator and such and such, not a person striving to overcome these things. There was a man in fornication in the church of Corinth, and no one resisted him. So if someone is bold in transgression, we have to resist being accomplices to their transgression and not company with them eating together. Can you read 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22, please? This is specifically talking about feasts and holy days, correct? Or all together. Well, he, sure. said, he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, he was talking about keeping a feast. Right. And then he told them not to eat with them. So don't eat on the feast with them. He also said not to keep company with them. And the right. word company meant to associate. So okay. it's Correct. the feast day. And then from what I think he's talking about, it's in general, like you can't just kick with the person and everything's okay. Because as a believer, they should know better. They're more accountable than people in the world. You know, those that are outside, Allah Hayyam judge it. But we amongst each other, we judge amongst ourselves. That's correct. I just wanted to be clarified for everybody to um to I know that it. right. To know that he was talking about feast days and he talking about it in general because you don't want the person to have the notion that what they're doing is okay and that I'm just not gonna hang out with you in front of the congregation, but I'm gonna hang out with you in private, which is hypocrisy. So we have to be on the same level all the time so that that person will repent. Because if people are hanging with him on the low or hanging with her in private, then that person doesn't feel the need to repent because some people are justifying what he's doing and, and it's just going to make a division amongst the congregation for people, the people that stand in for him to do what's right and disassociating and the people that are still associating with him privately. So it causes that contention. Right. That's why with that situation, as an example, Paul told him in verse five to deliver him unto Satan, right. let separate him so that he'll consider what he's actually doing. And then in Thessalonians, he talks about how yet don't count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So, so we don't associate, but we're still like, you may text or call a person. Hey, still cordial. 
You're still yeah, cordial. Right. You're just because you don't treat right. them as an enemy. You know, so you're still cordial right. with the person. You're just I'm just not gonna be hanging and kicking it, kicking it with you. Right. Until you get it like together. Ignore that text and, yeah, it ain't ignore them and don't if they talk to you, don't talk back or anything like that. Right. Treat them as a person, as a human being ought to be treated. Thank you for that clarity. No problem. And these type the reason we have to do these things is as Paul is explaining, first Timothy chapter five, verse twenty-two, please. Lay hands suddenly on no man. Neither be partaker of another man's sins. Keep thyself pure. We we have to do this because we can't partake in other people's sins. We have to remain pure. Hence, we can't eat with the person in the feast, nor associate with them casually, like what they were doing is okay, as Zach was explaining. Can you read First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12, please? For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? So we don't judge unbelievers by separating from them in casual get-togethers, but we judge amongst ourselves in a faith, holding each other accountable to do right by not keeping feast with the person walking in transgression unrepentantly. Can you read verse 13, please? But them that are without Elohim judgeth, therefore put away from among you yourselves that wicked person. We don't judge the men of the world yet we don't just look past a fellow believer who is boldly walking in unrighteousness because we have a calling and responsibility to keep each other accountable and as believers we ought to know better so we have to separate from that person also not only if a believer is walking in iniquity or as reprobate we must not eat on the feast days with them or associate with them but also if a brother or sister come with doctrines that are not agreeable to the teachings of the apostles and holy prophets, and they're being contentious, we aren't supposed to agree. And we simply keep our traditions handed down to us. Can you read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 16, please? But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of al -Hayim. There we see the simple response if someone's contentious to sound doctrine. We simply speak what we stand for as a church, relay in our customs, and continue our walk, not arguing or being contentious with folks. If the person doesn't agree, we ought to keep company with them either, if they won't obey the words of the apostles. Can you read 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14, please? And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. There you see, so the purpose of not associating with the brother or sister is in hopes that they be ashamed and repent. We have to encourage that brother or sister, though we can't keep company with them as well. Can you read uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 15, please? Yet yeah, count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. The separation from brothers and sisters not associating with them aren't to treat them as enemies, but as a means of exhorting them to repent and change. We will still reach out to them and admonish them as brethren. The brother or sister going the wrong way is to be admonished and restored in meekness, not with a braiding speech, railing, or arguing. Can you read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 to 26, please? This is only talking about your brother, right? Those in the faith, correct? Right. This is for people okay. in the faith of Yahweh Christ. I want to make sure That's everybody understands. Thank you for the clarity on that. Okay. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If Allah am pure adventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil or are taken captive by him at his will. So sometimes believers who are fallen in the faith have to be separated to learn not to blaspheme. This is not something new. Can you read 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20, please? Of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme? They blaspheme by not holding the faith and good conscience. 
Can you read First Timothy chapter 1, verse 19, please? Hold in faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwrecked. Yet, if they come to repentance, whether they stop fornicating like the man in Corinth, or have a change of heart and obey the traditions had endowed to us, or stop blaspheming, endeavoring to keep the faith in truth, we receive them lest the enemy get an advantage. Can you read Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, please? Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted on many. So the punishment of having to separate that person and them being apart, it was inflicted on others also because we also hurt too having to dissociate with a brother or sister because we count their shortcomings as our own. Can you read First Clement chapter 2, verse 6, please? Every sedition and every schism was abominable to you. You mourned over the transgressions of your neighbors. You judged their shortcomings to be your own. So when they come to repentance, we rejoice in forgiving them and comforting them. Can you read Sirach chapter 8, verse 5, please? Reproach not a man that turneth from sin, but remember that ye are all worthy of punishment. Can you read 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7? Please. So that contrary wise, ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him. These perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Right. If the person is overtaken in sorrow at their fault, we have to encourage them in meekness. Lest we be tempted to look down on that brother ourselves. Can you read Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 to 3 please? Brother, if a man be overtaken in a fault... You which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Consider in thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Keeping the right mindset of bearing the cross for the brother, considering his sin as our own will help keep us from getting lifted up, looking down on him, or being frustrated with him as if we are any better. Also, there's something important in the Testament of Judah. He mentioned how he didn't have compassion for Reuben in his transgression. And then some evil spirits conspired against him to get him to fall because he didn't show compassion. So we have to keep ourselves in compassion toward that person or whatever they're going through, lest that same transgression and other spirits stir up and conspire against us to cause us to fall. That's what I was trying to say. I apologize. <laughs> Continue, please. Uh, Galatians 6 and 2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. If we think we're something because we didn't make the same mistake, we are deceiving ourselves. Continue to verse 4, please. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. We each have our trial and may fall to something that another brother won't fall to. Continue, please, in verse 5. For every man shall bear his own burden. Knowing these things, we forgive brethren in the faith that come to repentance. Can you read 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, please? To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it? For your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. The Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We know he plays on guiltiness and sorrow. So, now to those who aren't brothers and sisters in the faith, but are heretics, we have to deal differently. The definition of a heretic is a person holding an opinion at odds with what is generally accepted. And the Greek definition of heretic he is G141, a schismatic, factitious, a follower of false doctrine. So a person who follows a different doctrine than the accepted traditions handed down by the apostles and prophets, and they favor schisms and are contentious, is a heretic. We have been commanded the following in these cases. Can you read Titus chapter 3, verse 10 and 11, please? You're saying some big words, man. You might want to let people know what you said. <laughs> a schismatic, 
I looked that definition up. It was like a person who likes schism. They like division. Right. And a factitious is someone who they are into factions. They like to, they're contentious. That's a simpler word for it. They're they contentious. Like, they oh, they like argue. groups. Yeah, they, they like to right. separation. Right. They like, they like having their crew, like their group. Like this is my group right. in the church. Like these are the people I talk to. Go ahead. Man. Yeah, yeah. That that's that could that definitely fits. Um, factitious by definition, re relating to or inclined to a state of faction, and that doesn't really help us. What is a state of faction? One moment. I knew I should have put the definitions. In. Faction, a small, organized, dissenting group within a larger one, especially mm -hmm. in politics. So, yeah, it's clicks. Right. <laughs> that's it. Clicky. Right. And that's not the spirit from above. Right. The spirit from above is without partiality. Right. Right. So, I think I messed up. You Can you say it again, please? No, I said we're just supposed to be impartial. Yes, sir. So... You find that that type of person, they have their own doctrine and have their own little clique of who they hang with. Oh, I forgot schismatic. Hold up. I get that to you. A separatist. So characterized by or favoring schism. On the lines that they like that division. Clicky. Well, that's interesting because a schismatic doesn't necessarily have to be clicky. A schismatic can be somebody that doesn't want to be associated with other people. They can literally just be a loner, someone who goes according to their own doctrine or their own thoughts and doesn't deal with a group of people. That's separatist, yeah. Right. Shells apart. So you know, we know from part of us. Go ahead. You can definitely apply that to somebody within a group as well, because they will still be that way, but they'll try to click to a certain amount of people, but they won't be that same way with everybody. So it, it definitely applies, and I can see how it goes into factitious as well. Thanks for explaining it. Hopefully everybody understands. <laughs> and then the problem, the problem comes up is, why are you separating from the rest of the church? Because of the false doctrines. Because <laughs> you yeah. have a different ideology than than the rest of the church, usually. And that's why you click up with those certain people. So. You're right. And Barnabas explained, usually those that do that tend to think that um, they've already made it. Like They think they're better than the other people. Like so, Barnabas explains supposed to all come together for the common good. All right. And Paul taught us not to compare ourselves amongst ourselves right. or count ourselves to be a part of the number. That's not wise. All right. These type of persons. Did you have anything else, Zachwa? No, 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 I'm ready to go. All right. Can you read Titus chapter 3, verse 10 and 11 for our admonitions for these situations? A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. So this refers to the type of people we we're talking about, whether man or woman, that tries to teach or force their doctrine on others, or they're creating division amongst others, or they're separating themselves from others. Not just one hanging out in peace right, right so, so we're not talking about believers in total uh if a believer right. or a brother starts coming in with heresy after the first and second admonition reject them then you don't deal with that brother anymore or that sister but in a broad spectrum of just people that are unbelievers as long as they don't come with a false doctrine and they're trying to to impose their doctrine on people then you don't have any problem. You don't have to reject them because they're not trying to imply their beliefs on anyone or trying to cause division. But the scripture does say if a man in general, and now this isn't a brother or sister, 
if a man comes and he's preaching another doctrine, then do not wish him out of high speed. Now that scripture applies to a man in general, a woman in general. Right. And it was specific about what doctrine they'll be preaching. Second right. um, John chapter one. Verse five says, and now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that, as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. Verse 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Yahche Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. And look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not Allahim. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Allahim speed. For he that billeth him Allahim speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. The doctrine of Christ is very important. If someone comes with something contrary to that, don't wish them well in that belief. All right. All right. Um, uh, Titus 3 and 11. Are you ready? Right. Yes, sir. Right. Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. So we see the person is doing it to themselves. Hence, after the second admission, you reject them. That doesn't mean you treat them bad. We have right. to let them be, not forcing anyone or arguing, but being gentle. In that rejecting, we don't treat them mean, but we just let them be ignorant and walk in wisdom toward them, not casting pearls onto unready ears. We learn from that experience not to say anything else to them. Can you read 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 38, please? But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Then you see, let them be. It's not something to go back and forth about. Can you read Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, please? Give not that which is holy unto dogs. Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. So those types of people, dogs and swine, you have to be mindful. And can you read Barnabas chapter 19, verse 4, please? The word of Elohim shall not come forth from thee, where any are unclean. So that lets us know why we don't say certain things amongst people in the world. Because we're not supposed to speak about Elohim, where there are people unclean and unready hearts and ears. It's wise not to speak of holy things unto folks who aren't ready for it nor the heretical types who like contention and debate. Can you read Proverbs chapter 9, verse 7, please? He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Sirach chapter 8, verse 3, please. Strive not with a man that is full of tongue, and heap not wood upon the fire. That's a wise thing to keep in mind. See somebody has an answer for everything and just wants to talk, let them be. Don't strive with them. In wisdom, as harmless doves, we have to be mindful of when and if even we should speak so as not to get a reproach upon ourselves. Can you read Sirach chapter 20, verse 5 to 7, please? There is one that keepeth silence and is found wise, and another by much babbling becometh hateful. See what the wisdom was teaching us? If we keep trying to tell people what they should do and etc., we would become hateful. And we would deter them, not being gentle and merciful to wait on the right time. Continue, please. Some man holdeth his tongue because he hath not an answer. And some keepeth silence knowing his time. A wise man will hold his tongue till he see opportunity. 
but a babbler and a fool will regard no time. Being unwise to speak with no regard for the proper season is in wisdom. Can you read Sirach chapter 20, verse 19 and 20, please? An unseasonable tale will always be in the mouth of the unwise. A wise sentence shall be rejected when it cometh out of a fool's mouth, but he will not speak it in due season. Now we have all made such mistakes, probably. Let us pray the Lord make us wise to know when to speak at the right season by growing us from such childish ways. Can you read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, please? When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Chapter 14, verse 20, please. Brethren, be not children in understanding. I be it in malice, be ye children, but in understanding, be men. Amen. Amen. Now, in regards to unbelievers who don't know better and or want to keep the feast to come get the experience, we are not to invite them to the holy feast since it is holy. But if the Lord put it in their hearts to request and invite them themselves, even as Christ, who didn't resist sinners from coming unto him, so that they may be healed by the good physician, we are not to resist them either. Can you read Luke chapter 5, verse 32, please? I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It'll be more sinners than allegedly good people that will come unto him. Can you read 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, please? This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Yahweh came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Amen. So a situation may be like somebody you know from casual or old friend or something, or somebody that's been working with you, have been around you, notice how you live and the things you're into. They might want, they may ask to, like, hey, can I come to the feast? I'd like to see how it goes. Just because they might not believe what we believe, Allah ain't put in their heart to be interested, of course. So for understanding some situation, that could bring that about. It's not where we go tell them what we're doing and invite them when they don't know anything about it to bring them a reproach upon themselves to do something without knowledge and trespass. But possibly. Yeah, that, you know, that, that makes a big difference. Because if... If you invite somebody somewhere, their their mindset is you invited me. I came as I am. You know how I am, and you invited me. I'm not going to change. But somebody who's asking, inquiring of you of something, they're more acceptable and they're more respectful to what it is that you have going on, and they're coming with a purpose. They actually want to see what you have going on, and they respect it. So, and they're they're curious. So there's a big difference in those. Yeah. yeah, they were curious coming up to Yache, come sit in the eating room, want to hang around, want to learn. From right, them. right. Praise that I have. Being gentle unto folks in such manners will win them over. Can you read Titus chapter 3, verse 2 to 3, please? To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle. Showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. When they come around us in general and they see the gentle behavior, the gentle mindset toward everyone, the meekness toward all people, things like that is what will make them wonder, like, what are you really into? Because nobody acts like this. <laughs> Can you read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, please? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Your interaction, your words, and how you operate is what is going to bring people unto Christ. Can you read Titus chapter 2, verse 7, please? In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, and doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Now, what about being invited by unbelievers to casual outings? Can you read 
First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 27, please. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no question for conscience sake. There you go. They say, hey, bro, you want to come over? We're about to cook. Cool. You be inclined to go, go, eat. Don't ask no questions. Pray over your stuff, of course. Make sure it's according to the word of Allah Hayyam and pray so that it be sanctified and be sure it wasn't, you know, contaminated by another unclean food by chance and enjoy the meal. All right. This is the verse to not talk about eating unclean food, okay? Just right. So everybody understands. <laughs> right. Just so everybody <laughs> understands. Right. Right, I have to be sure, like, hold up, make sure we be complete and explaining this before somebody be led us the wrong way. It is not whatever they sit in front of you, eat it. He literally, right. he literally talking about idols. So that's what he's referring to. So Right. And he in the Corinthians, he said he speaks to them that know the law. So the people right. were aware when he's saying this, he's not saying anything contrary to the law. Now, that's what we do if we're casually invited. Now, what if we're invited to an idolatrous feast like birthdays or Christmas parties? Oh, they tell me they grilling for July 4th. Look, look that's a big one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they they grill for July 4th. What do we do in such situation? Exodus 23 and 7, please. Keep thee far from a false matter. And the innocent and righteous slay thou not, for I will not be justified, for I, for I will not justify the wicked. We can't partake in justifying the wrong practices. We have to keep far from a false matter. Can you read First Clement chapter 21, verse 5, please? Let us rather give offense to foolish and senseless men who exalt themselves and boast in the arrogance of their words than to Allah. We have to excuse ourselves from the idolatrous feast with meekness. Yet some folks may get offended nonetheless. It's better to offend by not going rather than provoking the Lord by going knowingly to feast unto idols, knowing whom the Gentiles sacrifice unto. Can you read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 19 to 22, please? What say I then, that the idol was anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say, that the thing which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to Elohim. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Now, on the other hand, what do we do if we be asked to a feast casually? And then once we're already there, they tell us it's in sacrifice to an idol. Which, in layman's terms, someone tells us this is some idolatrous feast, like a birthday dinner or a Christmas party. Can you read Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 28, please? Okay, so the difference in this one is that the first one, you knew what it was about. They told you up front, or you already knew yourself, what the day was or whatever was going on. And you're like, okay, I'm not going to go because I know exactly what you're doing, right? Now, on this wise, you're literally, somebody invites you. It's not on any day that you know about as being a, a, a pagan festival or feast. And somebody offers for you to come or invites you to come. And you're like, okay, yeah, I'll come. Right? Being ignorant of what's going on. <laughs> right. First um, Corinthians chapter 10, verse 28. Yes, sir. But if any man say unto you, this is offered and sacrificed unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So if we are already there and find out it's an idolatrous feast, we know an idol is nothing. So we don't have to run out the door or make a scene about it. We just simply don't eat or partake in idolatrous practices like saying happy birthday to the person. For their conscience sake, lest we be consenting unto the practice. Yet we can still be tranquil, interacting with folks and getting to know people there. Verse 29, please. Conscience, I say, not thy own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? 
we are at liberty to eat clean meat that we prayed over to sanctify it. But we can't if it causes another believer's conscience to be emboldened to eat of the sacrifices unto idols. Can you read 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 to 13, please? But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. So though you may end up in an idolatrous feast unawares, when it comes to our knowledge, we won't eat the sacrifices for the conscience of the sake of the person that showed it and for the sake of the brethren in the faith that are weak in the faith and see that meat as something offered to an idol. Right. Continue, please. For if any man see thee which has knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish, for whom Christ died. If we sit and eat the Christmas dinner, and then the believer thinks it's okay to partake in Christmas and sacrifices to those Allahayams, he will perish through us emboldening him since he saw us do it, or heard of us doing it. Now, it was something interesting that I didn't realize. You don't eat for the sake of the person that showed it. Notice, it ain't something you go say to the whole party, like, hey, what are y'all doing here? Right. It's just the one person that showed it, you don't do it for that reason, for them to know. You don't make a scene about it. Right. That's being harmless as a dove, <laughs> walking in wisdom. Paul was interesting because it wasn't the food. Even though he's talking about food, we already know not to partake in idolatrous practices. But he's literally talking about just eating. He's not talking about, like, if, if you were in the idol's temple and you were sitting there and you were eating, he's literally saying, don't eat the food for their sake. Like, they're going to see you eating the food and they're going to go off and start doing everything. Just because you're sitting there eating some food. The, the, there's nothing wrong with the food. Elohim created the food. The food is good. <laughs> like, an idol is nothing. <laughs> like, but right. it's just so that person doesn't think, hey, I, I'm going to go and worship this idol because he was worshiping an idol without even talking to you or without even getting the understanding. So it's just not to lay a stumbling block for people that are unlearned. So. Right. Or weak. Or weak in the faith. But same thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, can you continue please in first Corinthians chapter 8 verse 12 to 13 uh -huh. but when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience ye sin against Christ wherefore if meat make my brother to offend I will eat no flesh while the world standeth least I make my brother to offend so we're doing it for other men conscious because right. charity look is not after its own so this is actually how we walk in love in the midst of this world can you read first Corinthians chapter 10 verse 31 please whether therefore ye eat or drink or what whatsoever ye do do all to the glory of Allah. so we have to consider others conscience so as not to eat for their sake but being there in that place, because you brought there, you didn't know what it was. Being there unknowingly is no trespass on our part. You have examples of believers being unwillingly in idolatrous environments and not eating of the sacrifices in faith to Allah. We have Daniel. Can you read Daniel chapter 1, verse 5 and 8, please? And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank. So nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Because the meat and wine were offered to his idols. Continue, please. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. The Babylonians worship God a deity of fortune, so one would want to be mindful of offerings unto that deity. You can reference who is God in the false doctrines playlist for edification on who that deity is. Another example of 
a believer dealing in wisdom is Judith in her simplicity when she gives the simple answer when in a situation at an idolatrous feast and being encouraged to eat. Can you read Judith chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, please? Then he commanded to bring her in where his plate was set and bade that they should prepare for her of his own meats and that she should drink of his own wine. Again, meat and wine offered to his idols. Continue, please. And Judah said, I will not eat thereof, lest there be an offense. But provision shall be made for me of the things that I, may, that I have brought. That's the simplicity of what we could do if we have to go to an idolatrous feast. Bring our own food and eat before we go. I'm sorry, bring our own food or eat before we go so as to have a just reason not to eat. If they persist that we eat, the answer is simple. I will not eat, lest there be an offense. Elahiah must have blinded his eyes because she was, she was, she really was, you know, she was doing it for the sake of her people, but at the same time, Judith was, she was still keeping the law at the same time when she was supposed to be done with our people deceiving him. <laughs> and she was literally keeping the law in front of him. Like, I... <laughs> Armless as the dove, like. Right. Like, at least you offend. I thought you were done with these people. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Right. Esther was sure not to drink of the offerings to idols either, though she was in high estate. Can you read the rest of Esther, chapter 4, verse 17, please? Sure. Uh, the rest of the book of Esther, chapter 14, verse 17. And that thy handmaid have not eaten at Ammon's table, and that I have not greatly esteemed the king's feast, nor drunk the wine of his drink offerings. So we see, sorry, we want to eat or drink things offered to idols. Going after the rights of another Allahian would be to our hurt, bringing about sorrow in our lives. Can you read Psalm 16 and 4, please? Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another Elohim. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. We don't call upon another, nor follow them because they actually ruin people's lives. Hence, you don't hear us calling on another Elohim. Or you also hear us use the word Elohim instead of the word of God because that's the name of an actual deity. Or we don't call upon any other deities also, save our Alahayam, Ahaya, Ashere, Ahaya, and the beloved Yache, Christ. Let's see how these idols ruin lives. Can you read Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 14, verse 11 and 12, and then read on through verse 21 to 30, please. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 14, verse 11. Therefore, even upon the idols of the Gentiles shall there be a visitation. Because in the creature of Elohim they are become an abomination, and stumbling blocks to the souls of men, and a snare to the feet of the unwise. For the devising of idols was the beginning of spiritual fornication, and the invention of them, the corruption of life. I'm jumping to Wisdom of Solomon chapter 14, verse 21. And this was an occasion to deceive the world, for men serving their calamity or tyranny did ascribe unto stones and stocks the incommunable name. Moreover, this was not enough for them, that they erred in the knowledge of Elohim, but whereas they lived in the great war of ignorance, those so great plagues called they peace. For while as they slew their children in sacrifices or used secret ceremonies or made revelings of strange rites, they kept neither lives nor marriages any longer undefiled, but either one slew another traitorously or grieved him by adultery, so that there reigned in all men without exception blood, manslaughter, theft, and dissimulation, corruption, unfaithfulness, tumult, perjury, disquieting of good men, forgetfulness of good turns, defiling of souls, changing of kind, disorder in marriages, 
adultery, and shameless uncleanness. For the worshiping of idols not to be named is the beginning, the cause, and the end of all evil. For either they are mad when they be merry, or prophesy lies, or live unjustly, or else lightly forswear themselves. For insomuch as their trust is in idols, which have no life, though they swear falsely, yet they look not to be hurt. Albeit for both causes shall they be justly punished, both because they thought not well of Elohim, giving heed unto idols, and also unjustly sworn deceit, despising holiness. Hopefully that helps understand why the world is the way it is. It's from the worship of idols. It's the beginning and cause of all evil. Now, hopefully that helps understand why we are to operate harmlessly. For the Gentiles, there's a special admonition for you to be mindful of as you come into the faith. Can you read Acts 15, verse 23, and then verse 28 and 29, please? Acts chapter 15, verse 23. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren sent greeting unto the brethren which of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Sicilia. Acts chapter 15, verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. Amen. Avoid things strangled for whatever reason. There used to be a thing where they would strangle animals and sacrifice to idols and stuff like that. Yeah. And on occasion, you can view the lust and gall, the lust of the eyes in the growth, or edific growth in the fruits edification playlist. You said there used know. to be a thing. I think they still do it. I they just do don't still do it. It um it has to, a lot to do with witchcraft. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I don't know about that. <laughs> All right. We now understand what wisdom the Lord has for us in these cases. Let us be mindful not to offend Allah in any case. Can you read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32 and 33, please? Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of Allah Even as I pleased all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, they may be saved. We are to please men by ensuring we don't set a bad example to cause them not to believe or transgress the law by our actions. Though we are among people that may live without law, we can't live without law to Allah being under the law of Christ, faith in his blood. Um, can you read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21 and 22, please? Mm -hmm. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to Elohim, but under the law of Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. We remain with law to Elohim because we walk in the spirit, which is subject to the law, instead of the carnal mind, which brings us to enmity with Ahaya, because it's not subject to his law. Continue, please. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Being harmless as doves in hopes of saving others is our journey. Can you read 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, please? Mm -hmm. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of Allah. Amen. Hope this was edifying. Um, Brother Zachor, you got anything? You know what was interesting? Um, when it comes to the Gentiles, the things that the Gentiles had to abstain from was very, very interesting. It says that you abstain from meats offered to idols, one, from blood, from things strangled, and from fornication. All those things have to do with witchcraft. The Gentiles are very endowed in witchcraft. 
because you know they do the blood, you know they drink the blood or they or they have to sprinkle the blood of animals, and they strangle the animal, so that goes into the witchcraft. Meats, they eat it usually, so it's things offered to idols, and then fornication usually goes along with the rites of the witchcraft. So it's, I, I, I don't take that very lightly as what they're, the four things that they harped on are big things of witchcraft. Makes sense. All right, everybody. Well, enjoy the rest of your Shabbat today. And for those that are on the other side of the world, you know, enjoy the first day of the week. May I bless you and keep you this week. And may you, may you keep you keep Allah Hayam in all your works. All right? Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shalom, everybody.